I, I'm going to try to do something related to what I was asked to do. And at least I have modules in the title here. <laughs> uh, but that's such a big topic, and it would take so long that I'm going to just talk about primates. And I also want to talk about some of our recent research. And, the recent, and this research involves uh, collections of columns or modules into a functional region, but it's still not a cortical area. It's part of a cortical area. So this is a little larger. And I want to talk about uh, two kinds of modules and uh, then these larger domains. And of course, we have to be a little cautious because we've seen modules and domains. And these words have been used in so many different ways already today. And when we get to the more cognitive part, we'll see another use of the word module. So the ones I want to talk about are of two types. Uh, and type one is the type that Moncastle meant when he used the word cortical column. And that is uh, isolation of a group of neurons and a patch of cortex from another one next to it because they have different response properties. And uh, he used the word column, and I don't want to use the word column because for me, I just want to use column for a vertical array of cells that exists throughout cortex everywhere. And it's always densely interconnected. And the neurons in that vertical array will have properties in common as a result of those dense connections. So we'll talk about groups of these kind of columns, which will form a module. And then later, I'll talk about how modules uh, go together and form a domain. And the other type, and that was the type that Moncastle was really interested in. The other type that we've already seen in talks today and yesterday is isolation of neurons due to discontinuities in the receptor's sheet. So I'll show you those two types and then go on and talk about uh, domains. And here's the classic module. This was done by Murray Goncasur when he's a graduate student with me and he's already a chair of a department, so this was a while back. And looking at the map of somatosensory cortex here, and there's a hand representation in primary somatosensory cortex of monkeys, and there's a region for each digit, and I'll get to that. But within each digit, there are regions where neurons in layer four clearly are responding to rapidly adapting inputs from the periphery or slowly adapting inputs from the periphery. So you have these regions that are responding to different kinds of peripheral receptors that are on the hand. And so this would be the classical sort of uh, Moncastle type of module where you're distinguishing groups of neurons in cortex by their differences in how they respond to inputs. This is just data that would support that kind of thing showing the electrode penetration. So the same digit is represented in within that region twice, one, once for one kind of receptor and once for the other kind of receptor. Another good example of this was Leah showed earlier, and that if you look at 3B in the duckbill platypus, it has input from electroreceptors there and input from touch receptors, and they divide up 3B in territory in a similar manner. Uh, so that you either are responding to one of those inputs or the other. Now, to go through this kind of, there aren't as many examples of this kind of module that you might like, but, and most of them are in the visual system because that's where it's been studied a lot, and that's where it's easy to show differences in stimuli because you can present differences in stimuli very easily for the visual system. And here's a prosimian primate with visual areas outlined. And this is one of them here, MT and MST over here, and a little area we call MTC crescent around it, and then other areas and so on. Now, if we go back and look at V1, in all primates, you get a pattern of ocular dominance, I mean, uh, or, uh, of uh, cytochrome oxidase dense puffs as Margaret Wong Riley originally called them, and Hubel and Weasel changed it to blobs. So these are the blobs, and they're separated from the surrounding cortex, where neurons are highly orientation selective, and not so in the blobs. 
They're more color related. Uh, and that kind of modular seg segregation exists in all primates. Uh, and we'll return to that, but we don't see blobs in uh, any of the close relatives of primates. So blobs evolved in the ancestors of primates and are retained in all present primates. Uh, you all see, see orientation modules within this, and I'll return to the issue of modulation of those orientation selective modules. In B2, you get thin bands and thick myelination bands. That was already shown by Leah, I think. And they alternate in between with pale bands. So altogether, you get three kinds of bands. They have different connections with neurons in B1. They have different outputs. And they have different response properties. Two of those kinds of bands, the myelinated ones, uh, also have neurons that are orientation selective and are divided up into submodules within. The other type has a color uh, subdivision within. So there are modules within these bands. Uh, you also get orientation selective neurons in B3, and they're organized into bands. And you get them also in MT, where they're organized into band. And each, each band or region for an orientation specific kind of, uh, of module uh, is subdivided into direction of movement modules. So you have two direction of movements uh, against the, in, uh, the direction of the orientation. So you have these are modules in visual system that you see everywhere in all primates and then you see maybe you can see darker and lighter areas in the cytochrome oxidase stain in this area called MTC like a string of pearls around this area and that suggests that there's some kind of modular organization within that but uh, nobody knows what it is for. Now this is one of the close relatives of primates it's a tree shoe. A lot of people have worked on tree shoes. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that originally Lugaro Clark thought they were primates, but they're a close relative, and it's the closest relative that's available for experimental study because the flying lemurs, you really can't study. Uh, but they're maybe as close or maybe closer. And then you jump to lagomorphs and rodents for comparisons. But if we look at, and this is from David Fitzpatrick's lab, look at stride cortex with optical imaging, and he looked at connections in the same case, look at it from the surface and looking down at cortex, you see the domains or modules, I would call it modules for different orientations. And so each, they're color coded here, and neurons over here would have this horizontal one, neurons in blue would have the vertical, more vertical one, and so on. And so these different stimuli will activate those groups of neurons. But these modules do not have sharp borders. You would gradually change from one kind to another. As you change the orientation, you would activate this activation pattern would move around on cortex as you change uh, the orientation. And modules of a like type are selectively interconnected, as this injection shows. So these, this is in tree shoes, and what's interesting about it is, is that rodents don't have anything like this. They have neurons, vertical arrays of neurons in, in cortex that are orientation selective, but they are not grouped in this way, and they're not ordered in this way. So this order is specific to all primates and tree shoes, so it might have evolved, probably did evolve, before the line going to present-day tree shoes and present-day in those two lines before they diverge, but not before the ancestors common in the common ancestor of rodents, say, and tree shoes and primates. Although this kind of pattern emerged again in carnivores. Now this is now I'll move to the other kind. Another kind of module that people talk about and demonstrate is, has to do with segregation of groups of neurons in cortex or other parts of the nervous system on the basis that the receptor sheet is not continuous. So we don't have these kind of modules for the auditory system because the receptor sheet is continuous. We, it's less apparent for the visual system because the receptor sheet is almost continuous. But, but for somatosensory, you divide up the receptor sheet in all kinds of different ways for different species. And 
this is it for the mole, as Ken showed uh, recently. And, <coughs> and you have a structure in cortex that's separated by a band for each one of these appendages on the face of the mole. I could have shown the barrel field for a rat or different parts of the rat, as it's already shown, same sort of thing. Each whisker on the side of the face has a particular module in cortex. And the reason for these modules is that the receptor sheet is not uniform. It has peaks or places of special stimulation or actual physical separations, and you get this kind of pattern. And what is very interesting, and Ken mentioned this, uh, and it's also true for the barrel field, as van der Luis has demonstrated, uh, that sometimes you get an extra ray in the periphery, an extra ray on the periphery, or sometimes one short, or an extra whisker for a mouse face, or one short, or several short. And whenever this changes, the thalamus changes, the, well, the first stage in the brainstem changes, the representation adds or subtracts to, to match the number perfectly, match it perfectly in the cortex, uh, in the thalamus, and match it in the multiple representations in cortex. So this provides an important source of information. Vanderloo said the periphery or the skin instructs the brain because the alternative seems very unlikely. The alternative would be that when you lose the gene that instructs the periphery and how many nose pieces or whiskers or whatever, the same gene would in instruct the whole brain. In some sense, it does. But there isn't even a gene for the number of, of these protrusions. There are other factors in development that determine the number of protrusions. So, the real argument here is that some message is sent on from the periphery, and they're saying these neurons, th these inputs are distinctly different from these inputs that are next to it. And the best guess is that activity patterns instruct the brain on how to segregate inputs all the way through to cortex. Now, in monkeys, as you've already seen, if you do a myelin stain or a stain for parvalbumin or a stain at a certain stage for serotonin or glutamate transporter 2, uh, cytochrome oxidase, all these things make primary areas stand out because they get a dense input from the thalamus. And here is the primary area standing out in an owl monkey and it has subdivisions, and some of these subdivisions are shown here. Uh, there are three subdivisions for different parts of the face. There's a subdivision for the tongue, the teeth, and other subdivisions for the ipsilateral teeth and tongue, and there are little modules that you can see and distinguish and identify. And there's a nice barrier here between the representation of the face and the hand, which is right next to it, and there's a septum that you always see there. Right there it is. But if you look at the hand area, and this is not a good one to look at, you can see that the hand area is also subdivided. And here's from a macaque monkey where it's most pronounced, but you also see it in New World monkeys. And here's the hand face border right here, that subdivision. And then there's a line for separating each of the digits. So you have all of the digit territories uh, lined up and apparent. And this turns out to be useful, but what is interesting is, is that when you record here, of course, all the neurons respond in the D1 territory to digit 1 and so on. Uh, if you do an experiment where you have a sensory loss and this cortex reorganizes and these territories no longer respond, they might even respond to the face, it doesn't matter. They respond to something new now. It doesn't matter. Those physical subdivisions, those septa remain for life. So that doesn't change, even if the physiology does change. Now, if you 
those cortical subdivisions are based on this complete segregation of the inputs from the thalamus, which are based on complete segregation of inputs from the cuneate nucleus, which are based on complete segregations of the inputs from the different digits. And at all those levels, they're segregated. And this is just to show that segregation at the level of the thalamus, because two of the digit regions are segregated, uh, are di digits two and four, physiologically identified and injected with tracers here, and you see two separate bands in the ventral posterior nucleus, and in, you can also see a weak band here. And so these are really separate representations of the digits. In adjacent sections, we would have stain or something that would reveal those bands very clearly, and you're right in the same bands uh, that you expect them to be in. Uh, uh, so the connections are highly, highly segregated in development, coming early in development and creating these groups of cells at all levels. Now, and this could be for any body part in the somatosensory system where there's a breakup and there's a discontinuity in the skin. Now, I said it's not quite that way in vision, but in vision, when you once get to the first station to relate to cortex, the lateral genica nucleus, you have the two eyes. And commonly, almost universally in mammals, you segregate the input from the two eyes. And they're segregated, but visiotopically matched. So central vision would be here, peripheral vision would be over here, going in this direction. This happens to be a lion, and for hi historical reasons, the two prominent layers in carnivores are called a and A1, but they're sec separated from each other, contralateral uh, input from the contralateral eye, ipsilateral eye, and the input from the contralateral eye actually has a defect in it in all mammals, and that is, is that you have to get the optic fibers out of the eye some way, so you have the optic disc where, where you have no receptors, and the blood vessels are coming in and out, and the axons are going out, and so that discontinuity in all kinds of mammals with a well-differentiated uh, lateral geniculate nucleus and detailed vision that this permits will have a discontinuity corresponding to that retinal defect in only the layers that get input from the contralateral eye. So this tells you at cortex, these neurons from the ipsilateral eye will activate that region in cortex because this is missing. So in cortex, you'll just see an area of monocular uh, inputs, and, and that fills in. So you don't see an actual missing place in cortex, but you do see a missing place in the lateral geniculate nucleus, all kinds of mammals. Now, I'd like to mention uh, what the effect of a mutation might have on this. And this was an accidental discovery of Ray Guillory many years ago that Siamese cats do not have a normal visual system because the eye, contralateral eye projects uh, too much. Uh, there are too many projections from the contralateral eye. It's not like a normal cat. So here's a normal cat. You have the area centralis and you have one layer, A, getting a, an orderly input from the ipsilateral eye here and the contralateral eye, a little bigger, here. And those two inputs then are relayed to cortex to form a binocular image, although there are ocular dominance columns there. Uh, notice that there are no breaks in either layer except the one for the disc, which is not shown here. And the two layers are not fused. If you look at a Siamese cat, there's a mistake. This contralateral input goes not just to the area centralis, but, or the equivalent of the phobia, but it goes past it some way and brings a part of the ipsilaterally projecting retina going contralaterally. It makes it too big. It goes to the right place, A, B, C. It goes to the right place. It goes to the layer that should get ipsilateral input. But there's no reason for this segregation anymore. So it fuses because the 1 and the A are next to one another. So it's just a continuous map coming right around and going over here. So they fuse and are continuous. But this part is not continuous with this anymore because it comes from over here. And so you isolate this part 
from the layer. So the layer has a subdivision in this. This is a fortunate kind of experiment, I think, because it's by nature. It's a mutation, and it tells us something about how these segregations occur. They occur from a disruption of the inputs. The inputs are from separate eyes. They could be some separate fingers and so on, but in the visual system, this is an example of the kind of separation that uh, would be rare otherwise. But there are ways of creating it. So I asked Martha Constantine Patton, and some of you might be familiar with her experiments from 40 years ago with three-eyed or four-eyed frogs and so on. So she can take a larva tadpole, developing tadpole, and take, borrow an eye, if you like, from another developing embryo, and cut a little slit in the, in, in the surface of, of the animal and put that forming, you know, stalk of an eye there, and it will grow up to be a frog with three eyes instead of two. What's remarkable about this is these two eyes on the same side of the head will go to the opposite optic, optic tectum and compete for territory. They both think they should go there, and they both want to form the same retinotopic pattern. So that the fact that they form the same pattern means that there's a chemical matching sort of thing, chemospecificity of some sort, that will guide them to the right place. But now, no frog has ever had binocular input like this into the optic tectum. It's not in their evolutionary past, but the remarkable thing is the system reacts and forms ocular dominance bands in the tectum, segregating one eye from the next in bands, just like you see in visual cortex of some primates. So what does this mean? This means that this is a trait that's inherent in the brain. It wasn't selected for to, call, for, to give ocular dominance columns in the tectum of the frog, but it's there for some other reason. And when Horton, for example, who has studied ocular dominance columns in different primates, and noticed how much they vary, amongst individuals of the same species, especially in squirrel monkeys, but some don't show it at all. They show it very weakly. Some show different patterns and so on. You, different parts of the visual field show different amounts. <laughs> and he concluded that he couldn't decide what ocular dominance columns were because this variability, all the animals seem to be fine with this variability. And I'd say, it's the wrong question. The wrong question isn't what our ocular dominance columns are, but why does the brain have these features where they use activity differences to create patterns of organization? And those patterns of organization, dependent on activity patterns, are used everywhere. Sometimes they might create ocular dominance columns, but it's a mistake, I think, to ask what ocular dominance columns are for. The question is, what are, what is that feature of selecting activity to isolate neurons so they respond to a narrower range of inputs? What is that providing for the animal? So that's my suggestion there. And here's just the evidence if you knock the, in these frogs, if you knock the activity out in the tectum, then the connections start to grow and they overlap one another and you lose this pattern over a period of time when the activity isn't <laughs> keeping them separate. So here are conclusions. And they have competing factors. For a visual area, you will have a competing factor of retinotopic matching and a factor that would say rejects inputs that aren't a lot alike. And those two will balance one another so that you will get an isolation of individual neurons and how they respond, or columns of neurons, vertical columns, arrays of neurons, because they'll all be activated by the same input. But some often neighborhood relationships where groups of neurons will pick the same class of input from the same body part or the same modality or whatever and isolate from near ones. Or you can have changes that are gradual in neuron properties. And so you won't have sharp borders, but you'll still have segregation. 
but the kind of segregation you got for orientation in tree shoes and in primates is not there in squirrels, and squirrels are highly visual. They have neurons selected for orientation, but those arrays of neurons, columns, vertical columns for orientation, are not organized. They're scattered, and yet no one's really shown a major difference in the visual abilities of these squirrels compared to tree shoes, which would be a good comparison. So we have to be a little worried about those sort of things. Uh, now, I like to go on to a bigger unit of cortical organization. And earlier, the talk dealt with domains. And this is, I'll use the word domain, but in a different sense. The domain will be a, a region of cortex that seems to be involved in a specific function. And within it, we'll have maybe modules, maybe just vertical arrays of neurons, and so on. But it's not a complete area. It's part of an area. I want to start by talking about how is motor cortex organized, because I think it's key to understanding what a domain might be and how it's organized, because such domains were first described in motor cortex. Here's an early investigation. Uh, involving Sherrington's experiments, where you stimulate electrically on the surface of the brain so it's not very discrete, and so on. But they got a map from foot to face and tongue by doing this in a chimpanzee. It's been done in humans, it's been done in a lot of animals, and so on. And the point is, is that there is a crude organization in motor cortex. But this organization isn't anything like the precise organization or somatotopy that you see in somatosensory cortex. And why is that difference there? The other thing that says this was described, maybe not on here, oh, first movement. This is a, a map of first movement. So when you electrically stimulate in the chimpanzee or other animals, and you just stimulate for a very for a period of time, say a fraction of a second, half a second or so, you won't get just one movement, you'll get a sequence of movements. And that isn't very good for dividing up the brain and saying the thumb is here, the foot is here, and so on. So they said we're going to do a map of first movements. What's the first movement? And that will give us a reasonable map. And since then, with the microstimulation, putting electrodes into the brain, down into layer five, where you can get, with low currents, very tiny, discrete movements, just that threshold, that's been the mapping technique. A very short, brief, of brief burst of electrical pulses at near threshold levels, and you get just a tiny little movement, and that's how you make a cortical map. And it has been very useful to use this tech technique to make cortical maps in conjunction with studies of architecture and connections. But here's a uh, New World monkey and owl monkey. Here's a uh, macaque monkey. And there's general agreement of a primary somatosensory area, premotor areas, uh, supplementary motor area, cingulate motor areas, and so on. And this complexity of motor areas appears to exist in all primates. A Eutherian mammals all seem to have at least M1, but it hasn't been clearly demonstrated that any other animals have this complexity of motor areas in the frontal cortex, and all primates have them. And here's one of the early maps from someone, Harry Gold, uh, working in my lab. And what was really surprising when you looked at microelectrodes and push them into the brain and stimulated layer five so you just got a very discrete movement, this is that you would get um, four paw digit movements at different places scattered around. And in fact, it's more detailed than that because you might get a particular digit moving and at another place you get another digit or you might get a digit to it moving in a different way. So all these different sites, you get a mixture. You get shoulder over here, wrist over here, and so on. Shoulder again, elbow over here, forearm in general, elbow, forearm, digits, and so on. And if you now go to 
uh, animal that's a little more uh, discreet with its movements of its digits, you get a lot more digit movements. This is a macaque monkey with a lot of cortex in, the, in a fissure and so on. But you get the same sort of thing as patchwork of movement types with a general overall body form. Now what's that patchwork? We called it a mosaic and other people have uh, demonstrated this in monkeys and so on over and over again. So there's a mosaic organization where if you electrically stimulate and get a finger movement, n you don't know exactly what's going to be next to it. In the somatotopic map, you move your electrode in that map, you know what you're going to get. But you move in the motor map, you might get a wrist movement or an elbow movement or so on. And then why are they in, why are these kind of s local columns repeated or a number of times within primary motor cortex. And it doesn't seem to be just here. This is from uh, Leah's lab, and it's a map of M1, uh, microstimulation map, and a squirrel, and you get this kind of patchwork in motor cortex of a squirrel as well. And I suspect it's very similar to this in M1 of any mammal with M1. So we were trying to think of what that can mean, and early on we even suggested that it might mean that this is a good way for getting complex movements of the type that Sherrington was talking about. Not just the first movement, but you want, if you continue to stimulate, additional movements. And so you might want a wrist area or module, or column, I'd say column, next to a digit one, next and next to that, or nearby somewhere, an elbow one, or a shoulder one. And by doing that, you can configure a sequence of movements. Uh, but there might be different ways of configuring sequences of movements, so you might want to repeat this kind of organization sort of randomly throughout motor cortex. I'll return to that, but I, we got interested in another aspect of motor cortex when I visited Princeton University and saw the experiments of uh, Michael Graziano. And what he was doing in awake monkeys with a chamber, electrically stimulating parts of motor cortex and getting complex movements. And he got a complex movement because instead of stimulating for 1 60th of a second or 1 50th of a second, uh, he stimulated for half a second. And his argument for half a second was is that a complex movement would take about a half a second. So you should stimulate about that length of time. And what he found is, is that motor cortex had different zones, he called them, and I'm going to call them domains, for complex manipulation, emphasizing central safe, uh, space, hand-to-mouth grasping, polysensory inputs here, but it's a def you get defensive movements from there. And then he went on, and also in one uh, publication looked at posterior parietal cortex. And he didn't find things in general, he didn't report things in general, but he did say that one area that has been defined in other ways, uh, in posterior parietal cortex, the ventral inner parietal area, if he stimulated there, he got defensive movements. He also got defensive movements in the polysensory zone up in motor cortex. So these two areas must be related some way because you get the same kind of defensive movements in both of them. And to show you that, he can get a defensive movement by antagonizing the macaque monkey with an air puff, doesn't hurt them any. And you get, uh, uh, the animal wants to protect itself by putting its hand in the way. And will also try to protect itself by squinting and closing the eye and grimacing. And you get that with the air puff, with electrical stimulation of VIP, and with the polysensory zone. So we wondered if this was characteristic of all primates, and can we investigate this further? And we have the advantage of having a number of different primates in the laboratory, and have also the advantage of having Ivona and Omar to really do the experiments. And they're responsible for the things I'm going to talk about. And we had some uh, prior uh, information on how 
cortex is organized in a prosimian primate, and we decided we should look first in prosimian primates. So that's one of the major branches of primate evolution, and prosimians, if any are, uh, of the primates, are the most likely to retain features that would re be represented in the brains of early primates uh, before the diversion into all the present. Uh, ones we have. So we've been interested in them in long ways, and I just want to point out that here are all the motor areas that you see, here are all the visual areas. That you, I mean, so this is a primate brain. You'd recognize that by the organization right away. And here's the som somatosensory cortex and so on. So posterior parietal cortex would constitute this region, and we already knew that visual inputs dominated in here and somatosensory inputs dominated in this here part here, but the visual in region here projects to here, so these would be multimodal, bimodal, bisensory, at least. And when we went to stimulate with electrical stimulation in posterior parietal cortex, we got movements, not in awake galagos, because this would be a little troublesome to chair train them, but they were anesthetized, and, and so we got bilateral four, uh, hind limb, fore limb movements here, as if the animal were trying to crawl or climb, uh, fore limb defensive here, hand to mouth here, uh, re reach movements from this region, face defensive movements here, eye movements here, face aggressive movements here, and over here, which is, we looked later and found a grasping area. So, and we looked at connections of these, and I'll talk more about the connections, but the connections involve sensory inputs and connections with premotor and motor cortex, and match domains in premotor and motor cortex. And uh, we have described the behaviors and reaching aggression, defensive, hand to mouth, and so on, and what's remarkable is in animal after animal, you find these in the same place. In electrode penetration after penetration, you find these movements in the same place. And the animal isn't motivated to do anything because it's, an, it's anesthetized. So we think we're getting a node in a complex circuit that activates most of the critical components of the circuit and will therefore cause the behavior. I should mention that not only have we demonstrated connections with motor and premotor cortex, specifically with matching uh, domains, but we've done this anatomically, we've done this with optical imaging, because one of the criticisms that we received is if you're electrically stimulating, you don't know what you're doing. It's going everywhere. If we electrically stimulate the domains in posterior parietal port cortex and image motor cortex optically, <coughs> you see activation exactly where you'd expect it, and not everywhere, exactly in the right domains. Not only that, but if we don't stimulate for half a second, but only stimulate for a sixtieth of a second, that would give a movement, just the first movement or a threshold movement in motor cortex to get nothing. You have to, from posterior parietal cortex, get close to the half second stimulation frame to get the whole thing to happen. Uh, but, if, but we still see the activation from the short stimulation. It's in the same place. So the, we, the short stimulation activates the same place, but it activates it for a shorter time and less intensely, and we don't get behavior in the anesthetized animal, at least. So we were interested now in saying how... Should, let, let's do the quick comparison with other primates. And we have been looking for all different kinds of behaviors, and we, we believe these are behaviors that are may be modified by learning, but they're not learned, they're innate. They're arranged, the, the domains are arranged in, uh, in the same pattern across all the primates that we've looked at. And so we, and we think that these are behaviors that would be very useful for animals to express early in life, and learning would really be a problem to uh, make them uh, useful unless they were al the brain was already pre-organized to make these behaviors easy to behave. But that's more of the commercial here. This is uh, the stimulation evidence, but this is an owl monkey, which is a New World monkey that's nocturnal, and the grasping region is right here. The defensive region for, for uh, arm 
is right here, and the reaching region is right here. Other regions are around here, and so on, but we just wanted to show where those three are. Same thing for a squirrel monkey, another New World monkey. Same order, not exactly the same way, but grasping, defense, reaching. And we are now uh, going to uh, macaque monkeys, and we're starting to study macaque monkeys. And so far, we've only demonstrated this grass region right here. But this is where Graziano demonstrated the defense region. And this is the region back here where Richard Anderson and co-workers describe neurons that are active when the animal is reaching. So that's the logical place from the other primates to look for the reaching region. And this is where we expect it. So our argument is, is that we expect all these primates to be organized in a similar way. And we would expect something like this in a human brain. And there are differences. The amount of posterior parietal cortex is greatly different. There is more space in between these in a macaque monkey uh, than in the other monkeys. And the orientation, if you notice, might be different. Because in a Galago, they go straight medial lateral. And in a macaque monkey, it's much at an angle with, with the reach posterior uh, shifted to a more posterior region. The other thing that's different is that the, a lot more of the visual inputs are, are direct from uh, extra stride visual areas, and they're indirect in the Galago to these same regions. So there are differences, and we can start to get a picture of evolution here. Uh, and uh, what we haven't described fully in any of these primates are the domains in motor and premotor cortex, uh, and because we still have to write those papers, but we have all the data for them. And basically, uh, there, you might get a reach zone in dorsal premotor. That's where the reach zone would be in the dorsal premotor area. And right next to it in motor area is the reach zone. So they're sort of fused together here. Others, for like defensive, are separated. Grasping are separated and so on. And they might involve for grasping and hand use more uh, the ventral uh, premotor area. But our premise is, is that you will have a larger domain in, that matches each domain in posterior parietal cortex in the premotor areas, but it will be in one or the other rather than both of them, and in motor cortex. And they're interconnected. And what happened in evolution uh, okay, uh, is that you have added this posterior parietal level of initiating behavior. It's often thought to be important in uh, planning behavior, in motivating behavior, and so on. It's not really clear from exactly what the words that should be used uh, uh, for this, how to describe it. But it's clear from these experiments that there are a number of, we would say, innate, natural, ethologically uh, relevant behaviors that are arranged in a sequence, and it's a body sequence, and that the face is most lateral, the bilateral use of the limbs is the most medial. It's arranged in a pattern, uh, but these behaviors are, are there. They can be initiated by sensory inputs and other inputs uh, from posterior parietal cortex. Posterior parietal cortex is obliged to work through premotor and motor cortex, because if we put muscimol in any of the domains, specific domains in motor cortex, nothing happens. You can simulate anywhere else and nothing happens. The changes that would happen, the behavior still happens if you do premotor cortex, but the behavior has changed. It's not quite the same, and we're working on trying to figure out what aspects premotor cortex adds. But, Primary motor cortex is essential for the behavior. Now here's our concept of what this might mean. That you have domains in motor cortex that are a mixture of cortical columns or vertical arrays of cells where this column might be involved in, in a wrist movement, this in an elbow movement, this uh, and a digit movement and so on. And these do other domains would have these same kind of movements embedded in them, but they would be used in a different way for a different purpose. 
So motor cortex is not a simple representation of motor movements or possible motor movements, but it's a repetition of possible motor movements that can be combined in different ways and accessed by different kinds of inputs to initiate different kinds of relevant behavior. Obviously, you also had to add in here a way of uh, influencing this output by learning, by experience, and so on. Otherwise, I would have never learned to ski or roller skate or any of those things, or any of us without having learning be a big component. But we have a framework here that uh, we think is innate, very comparable for all primates, uh, and that's a starting point. And a future kind of work would be to say, how can you modify that, or can you modify that through training experience and so on. And the final point I want to make is, is that this organization of posterior parietal cortex we think is unique for primates. It's similar across all these primates, but humans have a huge amount of posterior parietal cortex, and they've elaborated on this system to, uh, in a major way. Macaque monkeys have altered this system. So the, there are elements preserved and elements that are going to be added and changed. And we want to find out more about this. But the relatives, closest relatives of, of primates, and we've studied uh, rodents and tree shoes, yeah. they have very little cortex that you could define as posterior parietal cortex. It doesn't seem to have these features. It doesn't even have major connections with motor cortex or premotor cortex. Uh, so uh, we, and these uh, motor areas get visual inputs rather directly. As Lee was talking about, in a mouse, you're going to get uh, rather direct connections from visual cortex, primary visual cortex, up to motor cortex, and so on. So it's a different pattern, and so we have to ask, why, what did we gain by adding another step in the whole process? Probably motor cortex can be activated more directly, so for fast actions and so on. But we added another level of control uh, in a large region of posterior parietal cortex. And that's part of what makes primates primates and, and, and a little bit of what makes humans humans. So I'll end. I won't give this whole summary over again, but just say we have to pay attention to other primates and what we share with them. Uh, but we're all, the differences are also very important. <laughs> Thank you.